what I want to do this morning is, before we jump into next week, and we're actually going to start a, a brand new series that will carry us into January next week, but this morning I want to finish some of those thoughts around where we've been for the last couple of weeks, and if you've been with us, or maybe if you haven't, or listened in, or whatever, r- really the theory that I threw out there a couple of weeks ago was that when we look at this particular narrative in the bu- book of Isaiah, that perhaps what we're doing is we're looking at what was one of the most formative stories for Jesus. And the reason why I think that's important is as we think about Jesus and who he was and what he was all about and how he understood God and how he related to God, uh, we we have some options. And they're they're subtle theological options, but they're actually very important in my view. Like like one option is to assume that like Jesus, when he came out of the chute, was was pre-programmed to think, to have all these thoughts on God and all this way of living and these values. And of course, that would be representative of his being born God, but in my mind, to to assume that he just did things the way he did them and related to God the way he related because he was God is is, it's very unkind towards his humanness. It betrays some of what the Gospel of Luke tells us about Jesus growing up and some of what the author of Hebrews tells us about Jesus really having to do the work, which means that the other option, or at least another option, is to ask this question, like, where did Jesus get his ideas about God? And where did Jesus get his understanding of what it means to follow God and serve God and be Messiah. And, and, and again, you could just say he made it up. But what to me makes most sense is that he was formed by story. Because when you look at your life and mine, what you see is that, that, that the values you carry, the story you're trying to tell, uh, especially as you get into your 20s and 30s, like you've, you've decided which stories matter to you, which stories are beautiful and true and compelling. And this drives the way we live. And so my opinion would be that what we're getting from Jesus in the Gospels is a person who was God, but was, who deeply, was deeply formed and shaped by the suffering servant that Isaiah talks about. And so it's not that he made these ideas up. These ideas were present in the Hebrew Bible, but, but they were often missed. They were overlooked. And I don't think the point of that is even to demonize those people that Jesus shared life with, but to recognize that, that the way of life that Jesus is portraying as the victorious life, the way God becomes king, quite frankly, it's radical. It's difficult. It's, I mean, we have the benefit of Jesus putting skin on it in the cross and the resurrection, and still... It's really difficult to choose this path. So what I want to do this morning is, is grab one more, I think, really strong connection between this and that, Jesus and that story, by asking these questions around fear. Now, some of you probably got an email from me, uh, but it, it has to do with this issue of when is fear, and, and I don't want to assume that you've not thought about this, I'm just trying to contribute to the conversation which is happening for you already in life, but when is fear a sign that you're doing things well, and when is fear a sign that you're doing things wrong? Like we, we tend to re- label fear as a, as a bad emotion or a dark emotion. W- when does fear, like to what extent is fear a moral vice? And to what extent is the experience of fear actually a virtue? And one of the contexts I put that in is I was thinking back this week, I still remember laying in bed the night before Teresa and I signed our first, uh, our first mortgage, like before, before we signed our, bought our first house. Uh, we had for years been living, she moved into this basement apartment that my dad owned the house and it was rental property and the basement wasn't rented out and uh, as we were getting more serious, he gave that to her to live in when she quit her job to go back to college to become a nurse and rent was $150 a month. It, it was neither luxurious nor a pit, it was just a basement apartment and when we got married, I moved into there and we lived there, I think, for almost five years and it was, it was 150 bucks. And I remember laying in that apartment, in that bedroom, the night before we were going to sign the next day, thinking to myself, what am I doing? Like, why are we doing this? This is dumb. Why are we quadrupling our house payment like, or, or our cost of living that way? Like, what, what, why? And, and it was, for me, one of those first instances where I realized, like, I'm not free anymore. Like, at this point, up until then, you know, you could, you, you could quit and do anything. You didn't have to have the job you did. We just had gotten full-time jobs, or I, I did, and she was just getting started in nursing. And there was this sense of, like, why are we doing this? This is silly. And now I look back on that, and you, you may or may not share the opinion, but I look back on that and go, actually, I think that that emotion was a good sign. It, it, it's, it to me, indicates that 
that I was taking seriously the commitment that I was making to a lender, to me it indicates that there was this reality of responsibility that that, that, that isn't a light thing. And even though now I think about it, I think the reason I was thinking about this is when you look at housing costs now, I suddenly feel like the old guy where I'm like, how are our kids ever going to afford a house? Like our first mortgage, and it was just, what, I guess less than 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it, it was for $79,000. It was a pretty good house. Our payment was like 650 bucks. I don't think you could rent a shack for that right now. And yet there's the sense of like, that was good emotion. So that's what I want to ask is when, when is fear actually a positive negative, so to speak? Like when is it a good sign? When is it God's way of saying, yep, stay down this, this path? And when does it indicate that you're on the wrong path? Around that same time, I got to perform the wedding, uh, a wedding for a friend. And weddings are always an honor to perform for people, but especially when it's a friend, it's, it's always lots of fun. And, and this friend, some of you will know him, but he was super quirky and super hilarious, and he was pretty young. And the wedding was, it was in late August. It was at harvest, so up in the Billings Heights. It was like a 95-degree day. I think it was a 5 o'clock wedding ceremony, which means pictures were at like 3 o'clock outside. So that's the context. So we're up in that, you know, usually you have a room set aside where the groomsmen and the groom and people hang out beforehand. And so we're up in that room and we're all getting dressed, putting on our plastic shoes and our like stark black tuxes and things. And I remember watching the groom who was pretty eccentric and fun to begin with. I remember, this sounds weird, but I remember watching him get dressed and realizing he didn't put an undershirt on, which is a little bit weird because those shirts are so thin and I realized it is going to be so hot. So somehow I took mental note somewhat subconsciously of like, oh man, he's going to be a sweaty mess. Well, then he's fully dressed. We're getting ready to go. And I couldn't help but notice, a little overbearing perhaps, that, that he hadn't put any deodorant on. So I, I don't know what he had done that morning, but in my head I'm like, nobody wants to have B.O. at their wedding ceremony. So I'm going to help the guy out. So I said to him, hey, Chris, did you, have you put any deodorant on? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I said, well, you, you might want to put some extra on. He goes, okay. And so I'm not ex- so he, I watched him. Because, he, 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 you know, those things are like straight jackets. Like, I don't think you could put deodorant up inside those things if you wanted to. So I just, I watched him. I remember he, he unbuttoned his, his thing, just his cuff, just like this. And he starts like reefing on, on his shirt. And I'm like, there's no way. This isn't possible. And then he got it to about here and he grabbed his deodorant and he went. And I'm watching this like, what the heck? And then he, and he does this thing. And I, I th- I'm thinking it's a joke. And then he does it over here. And he. Grabs his sleeve, puts the deodorant around and buttons his cuff up and he's done. Like, what in the world is going on? So I, I don't remember whether it was like that day or that moment or a week later. I actually don't remember when, but I was like, hey, Chris, do you remember when I asked you or suggested you should put some extra deodorant on before your wedding? And he goes, no. I said, you don't? I said, no. I said, well, I did. We were getting dressed. And I said, hey, you might want to put on some extra deodorant. And he said, I did? I said, yeah. I said, do you remember? So then you don't remember what you did, do you? And he's like, no. And so I kind of showed him. And he's like, what? I did what? He had absolutely no idea what he had done, which made me feel better. Because I was like, man, does, is, does he know something about hygiene? I don't know. Or does somebody, did his mama not teach him anything? Like, what is going on here? I look back on that now and I go, makes perfect sense, doesn't it? In fact, everybody who's ever been through a wedding ceremony, or if, especially I would think if you have daughters, there's probably this sense of like, you better be that nervous before you do that. I look back on that and go, like, I, I think actually that was normal. Now, I, I don't think I put deodorant on my elbows when I was getting married, but it's an appropriate time to feel a certain level of fear, isn't it? Which is, again, it brings me back to this question, and I don't think I'll ever do a PhD, but if I did, it would be around this idea of fear and faith, and not just my opinion, but how does the, how does the Bible interact on this issue? Because here's my sense, and I think this is being exposed by COVID exponentially. Me especially, I especially, I want a God who defines faithfulness with comfort, and therefore, it's really easy for me to conclude fear equals bad. 100% of the time. But when I look in the story of the text, what, what strikes me is over and over and over again, it's often speaking of fear as in some sense a positive thing. And to whatever extent that's true, many of you may or may not know, many of you will know, some of you may not, Jesus' most repeated command in the Gospels was fear not. Not his most repeated, it wasn't his most common topic, but the command that he gave more than any other according to the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was fear not. 
This is what stood out to me when I started reading Isaiah. And the reason I actually started re- studying this passage of Isaiah was I've heard different people talk about how important this passage is to understanding Jesus in our day and what it means uh, to, to, for God to become king. And so I took this class from N.T. Wright, and that was helpful, and there's been some fun stuff from there. But I, there was a theme that started to emerge for me that I, I, had, I struggled to find someone else comment on, so I could be all wet on this one. But the theme was this. Fear not is a major theme of these very same chapters in Isaiah. And so therefore, if it's true that Jesus' idea of self-giving love and service comes from these chapters, it makes me wonder, what can we learn about what Jesus meant about fear not from the context of these very places in the text? So here's what I want to do is, I actually don't have a lot of narrative for you this morning. We're going to look at 10, well, there's 10 different commands in what really amounts to the first four chapters of, of Isaiah 40 to 55. But as I read, my challenge to you would be, uh, pay attention to the context. You know, th- think of like the commencement speech or the coach to the team or the friend sitting across from a friend giving advice. And of course, I've already told you, the advice we're going to read is fear not, but what's the context? Like what, what's going on that, that's causing the need to say to the person fear not? Because I think that's actually a really important aspect of this. So I'm just going to start working through these. Isaiah chapter 40 the first of the ten commands, or of the ten fear not commands that I was able to find is in verse nine. It says this Get up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings, which just means good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, and here's the first one do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. He's coming back. So so the context is what? Well, it has something to do with Isaiah is telling somebody to speak to these people who have been in exile, who have been going through these hard times, who have no physical evidence that God is in control and leading their lives, that God, like, you didn't expect exiled um, people to recover. He's saying, hey, announce God is returning. Okay, so let, let's, let's keep going. Isaiah 41.10. And this, for me, is one of the culminating ones. In fact, I want to start in verse 9 because this one is really clear on what the context is. Verse 9 says, you are my servant. So remember, we talked about this last week. This is ideal Israel. This is God saying to Israel, here's the role I have for you before ultimately Jesus played it. I've chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Again, here's my question. When God says, fear not, is he looking at somebody who's getting ready to jump off the high dive? Not that it's not okay to fear fear, fear there, but is it some kind of what you might call trivial or luxurious kind of risk? Well, clearly it's not. He's speaking to a people who's saying, your job, your existence is to go serve people, which it would start to make sense then that that would imply scary stuff, right? Right? And as I think about you and genuinely try to pray for people in this place, like, you're all over the place. Whether you're in the medical field or a classroom teacher or a business owner or you're in a relationship, if you're in a field that's been deeply affected by COVID, like, there's this sense of purpose. Many of you, I dare say most of you have it when things are clear. You have this clear sense of how it is you want to exist in the world, how, what kind of story you want to tell. And in those moments, it's not about you. And yet the very nature of what you do and what we do, the degree to which it is for others, it it conjures up fear. So wouldn't it make sense that God would constantly revisit this? Verse 13, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, Do not fear, I will help you. But again, help you what? Help you what? Verse 14, Do not fear, you worm Jacob, you insect Israel. Now, just to be clear, that, because that sounds really offensive to us, worm, it, it's just an idiom, it, it means helpless. So in the same way Jesus looked at his mom and said, woman, now's not the time, that wasn't, it's offensive to us, it wasn't in their context. Worm just means helpless. How many of you feel helpless? And to what extent is helplessness, not in the sense that you've given up, but helplessness in the sense of like it's bigger than you, to what extent is that actually a good thing? Maybe you've got kids. Maybe maybe you're about to have your first kid. Maybe you're looking at a season of life where you don't know that you could endure the type of medical challenges and ultimately facing death that come. To what extent is God saying fear not in the midst of situations that by all, according to all logic, are rightfully 
scary. 43.1, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Redeemed. This may be a reminder for some, not for others. This key word in the understanding of what the, the cross accomplishes for us and what God's love accomplishes in us. Redeemed is this word picture, really, of, of taking something that was used for unhealthy things or like just not good things or just dirty things. It's like taking something that was, used to be used to clean a toilet and not cleaning it up and putting it behind museum glass, but instead cleaning it up and then God using it for God's purposes. So again, it's so easy. It's a razor thin line, isn't it? What does it mean to be God's? And to what extent does that mean benefit? And to what extent does that mean responsibility? I think that's one of the hardest things that Tommy has to do in choosing music. Because it's, there's such a fine line between music that focuses too much and too often on me, 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 I, 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 and yet the reality of we get, we receive, we benefit, but there's always that so that. 43.5, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather them. 44 is another, for me, one of the high ones here. But now here, O Jacob, my servant. So there again, there's context. Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. Jeshuan, whom I have chosen. Again, notice the context. And to what extent is that context really important? Verse 8, do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God besides me? No, there's no other rock. I know not one. One more. And and just for those of you who are thinking like, okay, so relative to the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, how how frequent is this in, in, in Isaiah? It's very frequent. It's not actually that common of a command. That's part of what makes it so interesting. Jesus said it so often And if we're not careful, in my opinion, it it creates this kind of simpleton faith that says, if you have faith, you don't experience fear. But in context, it seems like Jesus is drawing something else out. 51.7. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people who have my teaching in your hearts. Do not fear the reproach of others and do not be dismayed when they revile you. So here's my question, I think ultimately, is how important is it that we keep the servant heart of God, Uh, we we talked last week about the vocational call of God. How important is it that that you keep the compelling why behind your life attached to the fear not? Was it Viktor Frankl, I think, was the first that psychiatrist in a Nazi concentration camp who said people can endure any why when, or any what when they have a compelling why? Is it possible that Jesus is purposely trying to keep these things two together and when we separate them, it loses a lot of its power? Like what are the things in your life that when one, one of the things goes away, the whole thing is meaningless? For me, that's jelly. <laughs> Thinking about this, like I, I don't know, how often do you eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? I probably have one like two or three times a year. It's just like I have this hankering for peanut butter and jelly and then I eat one and then an hour later I die of a sugar coma and I don't have one again for another six months. But whenever I go to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I'm always shocked that there's actually jelly in the house. Because it's like, what else do you use jelly for? And I don't think anybody else in my house even eats peanut butter and jelly. So I'll go, I'll be like, I'm going to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'll go to the refrigerator. I'll bet you there's no jelly. And there's always jelly there. I'm like, why? I don't understand. It it serves no purpose other than peanut butter and jelly for me. Velcro. One side of Velcro. Last service, I said, like, what else can you think of that when you take away half of it, it loses its meaning? But it, it got sideways quickly. So I decided we better not do that again. What, what if that's what's going on here? That we should always bear in mind that, that fear attached to the servant call of God, that, that's the right thing. And without it, well, what happens when we detach them? I, I'm reading an author right now, and it's the type of book I normally wouldn't read, but the person who gave it to me never, never, never gives me books, and I just, anyway. Uh, and one of the things he says is, it's very critical. He says, the American God is a deistic, therapeutic God. 
Now, his criticism, of course, is, you know, deism, of course, is saying that it's not attached to any kind of historical Christ or movement or tradition. It's just about a God who's really there but really detached from everyday life and doesn't really intervene. And therapeutic, and I struggle with this one because I've spent a lot of energy affirming the value of therapy and still do. I I think there's strong overlap between what a therapist or a coach and, frankly, what God in the New Testament does with people. But I think his criticism is worth at least pausing around. Because if I understand what he's saying, is he's saying the therapeutic God, it, it just, it, it's, this, it's this God that just cares about you being happy and you being healthy and you being whole and you know, your emotions never getting in your way and everything being comfortable. And I wonder if on some level the criticism isn't worth at least contemplating our own journeys. Because it strikes me that, that a deistic therapeutic God would take the fear not passages and carry them with them through all kinds of like, priorities that frankly might not be God's priorities. It, it would completely forget, and I, if to whatever degree this is true, I'm guilty of it more than anybody. I love a Jesus who just wants me to have good quiet times in my safe house and then go about and live my simple, little, quiet, comfortable, emotionally balanced life. I wonder if part of the value of COVID is the reminder that I have a friend and uh, they're they're, they're constantly saying, now I lost the exact phrase, but it's something like everything, everything's unstable. Everything's unstable. What if that's part of the value of COVID? Is this invitation to step back into what it means to be the servant of God? And I think where there would be value there is there's this, maybe there's this audit that we get to go through. To whatever extent we've been able to slow down enough uh, to hear ourselves, to let the... Because f- I get it. I, I understand anxiety as is, is, is well as most. That Sometimes when you're in the, in the throes of a fear episode, you don't necessarily have logic. But the good news is uh, your adrenal glands can't pump forever. I've learned that too. What if part of the value, the logical faith value in the midst of those moments is just to ask, the, what's the fear attached to? And sometimes it might really lead to a place of repentance because sometimes fear is just this glaring reminder that your life has suddenly become about you. Me, 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 I, I, I. Safety, safety, safety. Maybe sometimes fear is an opportunity to to repent of deviating from the story you wanted to live. And at other times, maybe you're in one of these right now, fear is actually an attaboy, an attagirl. It's, it's It's a confirmation that the life God has called you into, the values he's given you, the, the occupation and the vocation that you're giving your life to, it's rightfully scary and difficult. And, and maybe sometimes that there's a way to turn that emotion and go like, oh yeah. Because Jesus didn't say fear not to a bunch of people who were trying to build a resort on the beach, frankly. He kept saying fear not to a bunch of people who would literally give their lives to serving people. And I don't want to get over, overly dramatic there, but it is this reminder that he, his thing was when you find your life, you lose it. And when you lose it, you find it. And I wonder if in other instances, and I can certainly relate to this one too, where you're in just this place, and maybe this is where you're at right now, like there's just really no fear bugging you. It's just kind of not there right now. And I wonder if those are in their own sense an opportunity to go, God, am I, am I missing something? Like did I, did I deny an invitation somewhere? You know, at Christmas, one of the things I always think about is Mary and Gabriel coming to Mary and saying, hey, would you? And she says, yep. And we've explored this a lot in, in, in my tenure around here of just this question of, was Mary the first Mary? Like, were there other teenage girls who were given the opportunity and the sacrifice involved that went like, nah, thanks, I got plans? I wonder, I know for me, that at times... A lack of fear in your life, it's not necessarily a good thing. It's an indication that maybe there was an invitation that you passed on and a chance to to re-engage. You know, I get it. This is tricky with a pandemic, and the last thing I want to start doing is, you know, offering that this is a simple solution. But I do wonder if we do well to slow down a little bit, to breathe a little bit, and make sure that the prevailing narrative of fear is the same narrative that we signed up for a couple years ago. And I'm not, if that's political, I'm sorry, that's really not my intent. Like, I'll, I'll wear a mask. I'm, I'm, it's not about any of that stuff. But I do think that if we're not careful, this is my, I have mostly optimism around the church and its future, despite all the endless speculation. My fear, if I have it, 
is to what extent will we emerge, and not just narrate, but just Christ followers, to what extent will we emerge from all this with the high value of service towards others that we entered into it with? And how do we know when what started off because it was dangerous has merged into it's just convenient? And I wonder if one of the prophetic voices for us in this season would be to make sure that we're creating space to make sure that the fears that we're listening to are ones that are attached to the servant call of God, not some other devious call. You know, the gospel as I understand it, is ultimately that Jesus is king and he became king via the cross. And to respond to the gospel is to say, Jesus, I, I, I want to be your apprentice, transformed inside out, deeply loved and valued, and yet the paradox, and we all know this, it's like, I think AA has it better than anybody, when you don't need us, we need you. The paradox is about the point at which we understand how deeply revered and valued we are by God, we're also invited to understand that our life's not about us. So when is fear an indication that you're doing that? And when is it something else? And when is a lack of it an indication that you're not doing that? And when is that something else? And I'll end on this. For me, what this reminds me of more than anything else is that this faith thing, it's not a solo deal. Because what I need more than anything in my life in the midst of a, of a fear episode or in the midst of fear logic are people who love me and know me well enough to go like, hey, I think you're listening to the wrong fear voice on this one. And frankly, I think part of what's emerging from COVID is the invitation uh, to deconstruct the, the solo faith journey just a little bit. So I'd like to pray for you, and we're going to sing our way out of here. God, Lord, I understand that there's, there's a context for every story in this room, and I'm grateful that your voice is louder and more clear and more accurate than my own. So I pray that as people navigate their emotional realities right now and try to make sense of them, whether they're in the room, when they're listening later in the week or whatever, um, that, that you'd give them this discerning spirit to know uh, what's the truth from you to cling to and what's the stuff to flush. God, I understand that there's this, there's this weird line between just like bravado, stupidity, and, and yet God-honoring risk-taking. And so within our personalities and wiring, within our occupations and vocations and families and relational contexts, uh, would you give us the wisdom to know what to do and the courage to do it? Amen. If you would like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook and Instagram.